Yeah, it does. <laughs> town but also the water quality piece because um, uh, we hear a lot from residents as well as board members um, having concerns about protecting our natural resource most notably the marsh um, that's kind of our our trademark here in Scarborough so everything essentially everything in Scarborough drains to the marsh there's a slight piece that heads up to Casco Bay but um, everything that we see substantially goes to the marsh. So I know that's on um, everyone's radar about trying to protect that. So um, tonight I'm gonna just go through a little bit of what staff looks at too and why we look at different things. Um, so not only looking at why we protect it and maybe the same light you do, um, we also have requirements that we have to look at and making sure that we know how this new development affects um, our compliance with that <coughs> permit. So. Um, I'm going to try to go through the basic stuff pretty quickly and just at the end um, really hone in on what how it connects with planning board. There are six items that we go through for criteria for our permit and two of which um, are really tied closely to what the planning board does so I'm going to focus on that at the end. Um, the fact sheet that you have in front of you um, is something that we have always at town hall. Um, it's kind of goes over just the basic requirements um, so that anyone can grab it and pick it up and know who to call on the back. There's context for everything um, and, uh, and who reports different pieces of the permit. So it all starts with the Clean Water um, Act and essentially um, we have a, a permit to discharge stormwater. Um, and, one of the things that, as Roger mentioned, I keep referring to is MS4. MS4 actually stands for Municipal Separate Storm Sewer System. So there's four S's there. That's where we get it. And essentially, um, you can see on the left um, is where the sewer goes. So essentially, Dave Hughes in the uh, Scarborough Sanitary District has a permit. They treat the sewer that comes in and they discharge it out. 
Um, same respect on the stormwater side, we have a conveyance system for our stormwater and we also need a permit to discharge that. So it's, um, that's from the Clean Water Act that both of those happen um, parallel. And so the key is keeping those separate um, and that what we are discharging is as clean as possible and that we're not impairing the waters that discharges too. So we're not alone. Um, Scarborough has a permit, but so does uh, 30, uh, 29 other municipalities in the state of Maine. And you can see the blue really um, is the urbanized areas. Those are the towns that are regulated as MS4 um, communities. And so they're clustered around um, Kittery and Portland, Lewiston and Bangor, those kind of um, centers where you would expect to have the most development, the most um, impervious surfaces, things like that. So um, we, um, because of that, we have, there's a heightened scrutiny um, by DEP and EPA and also some environmental groups. Um, there's Friends of Casco Bay, we have um, Friends of Scarborough Marsh, there's a lot of environmental groups in the area that um, keep an eye on which is good, um, protecting our resources. And they've been a partner in a lot of um, some of our watershed uh, projects to date. So, um, but with that comes some higher costs. Um, in the MS4 communities, there are certain regulations. Um, we have urban impaired streams, which they have to meet a higher standard from the state. So um, because of that, there's, there's different levels and, and uh, as I said, more costs associated with it. Typically, um, our MS4 permit is a five-year permit. However, we are currently in our sixth year because we have spent the last two years negotiating <coughs> with DEP on the requirements of that. Every five years when we renew, um, we, we walk through different um, increased criteria. So how can we improve things? How, um, and so there becomes more and more regulation that comes with that, which means more and more tasks and effort on the municipalities part. And so we try to walk through what does that mean um, and trying to have conversations with DEP to say, this is how it impacts the municipality. It's not as simple as doing this or that. And we all work together trying to come up with ways to incrementally increase um, those requirements um, without putting too much burden back on the municipalities. And so at this point, um, it looks like we are gonna be starting a permit year seven, um, and in that year we'll be gearing up for the new permit, um, which there are things that will be required. Are the regulations the same throughout each of these communities? Yes, are so those? what they do is they issue a general permit, yeah. um, the state of the Maine, so DEP, and um, I should say that we're a, they're a delegated authority basically for EPA. So our permit does look like the same as Bangor's, however, on top of that, we have to come up with a plan that says this is how we're going to, the town of Scarborough will specifically meet the requirements of that general permit. So we end up with coming up with their own like kind of de uh, detailed plan for Scarborough. So our plan could look very different than say Portland's. I hope it looks different than Portland's. <laughs> I'm going to point at Jen. <laughs> Far fewer roads under construction uh, for that reason. Right, right. That's, that's the reason, that's the reason for most of the large construction projects like the State Street closure last year, Preble, Preble Street will be closed this year in Portland and those are all mm -hmm. very large um, sewer separation projects. And for those who don't know, Jen works um, right, in the city of Portland in engineering. But what I was wondering about is yeah. like setbacks from streams and things like that. Oh. Uh, is that consistent throughout the or can no, each town that's go? our ordinance that wow. dictates certain things. But okay. there are some state statutes that require different things. Is that what you mean? For so the backs? towns could actually go above and beyond. You can that. go above and beyond it. Correct. Okay. Yep. And are we basically above and beyond? Uh, no. We're pretty consistent. I would say we're pretty consistent. There's some. Um, we do have some urban impaired streams where we have a watershed plan, which probably goes above and beyond because it's impaired um, and so part of um, it's trying to to make those healthy streams again so when they come in front of the planning board I might mention and we will hear it tonight you'll hear about one in Phillips Brook and basically we had outlined a plan for Phillips Brook and here's some of the things that we um, had gone through 
to map out that plan and that was it was endorsed by council as this is the direction we're going to move forward to to improve that stream so it's not in the ordinance but it's I don't know I guess it implied that we're, we're heading in that direction and so that's where the planning board comes in is to look at all of the things that are have been the studies and plans and those things that are kind of in place for the town um, and so that's one of them um, so there are six pieces to the permit um, and these are big umbrella pieces I'm gonna go through four of them fairly quickly and then the, I'm gonna end with um, construction site runoff control and post construction stormwater management because those are the two that really I think key into what the Planning Board does in the development so I'm going to go through this as quick as I can. Um, the first piece being public education and outreach. Uh, we work collaboratively with uh, 13 other communities in the greater Portland area. That's the symbol at the top that we affectionately call IZIWIG, the Interlocal Stormwater Working Group. Um, it's a bunch of stormwater geeks like me that sit around once a month and get to talk about stormwater. <laughs> and, um, and how we work collaboratively so that we can pool our money together and use it for, um, there are some ducky ads, there's a bunch of information on the websites. Um, they kind of tailor it as a general umbrella for Greater Portland and we, we kind of roll it out on our own little media pieces like on our Facebook pages or our town websites. They also come in and do, um, we have some education and our adult education with um, like yardscaping and talking about different ways um, to reduce like fertilizers and things like that. And, and so the, the issue with group, we went earlier talking about um, updating the permit and that process you sort of said we are going through. Oh. That it's not Scarborough sort of going alone on that, right? right? We're, we're working with the partners at IZIWIG to sort of help through that process. And maybe you just touch on that. Just <laughs> yep. Um, yeah. So yeah, the Portland group um, has we've had a, a subcommittee that we have been going through and talking about the renewal permit for like I said probably about two years and um, and I know this is where it comes in we hear a lot Robin was a big piece of that um, and with her role in the Cumberland County Soil and Water Conservation District um, so from there we have made comments back and forth to DEP as a collaborative group so Izzy Wig makes comments on behalf of the 14 communities we also partner a lot with uh, the Bangor group um, or the Lewiston Auburn and also the Southern group in Kittery. And so a lot of times, a lot of our comments are parallel. So they're hearing it from all of those clusters, we're calling them. Or um, in some cases, when there's um, things that go in front of, in, up in Augusta, we'll do it as one collaborative push and saying, here's what, how it affects us. And, and maybe kind of trying to steer that MMA as being our voice in that respect so um so that's again we're all kind of trying to work together so we're not reinventing the wheel and, and also having one voice which is a more powerful voice with the 30 communities and it's also obviously the largest development it needs so we have a stronger voice that way the second piece is public participation and every year i update this with my daughter crossing the finish line with my niece. <laughs> and this is our sustainability coordinator's son um, posing for me. Uh, along the trail, they do, a, they do a 5K, urban runoff we call it. Um, this is how we try to get the public to participate. Along the route, there are the signs talking about um, ways that it affects everybody, everyday life, um, and how you can help in your own way. Um, keep the um, natural resources preserved and protected and what stormwater means for your little piece of um, the world. So that raises money um, for, again, our IZIWIG group to put money back towards education and outreach. So we use that money back to go back into like schools and we help teachers come up with curriculum and things like that. That's where that money kind of goes back towards our, our mission. Three is um, a big one, but I'm going to breeze over it really quickly. This is where Mike's world comes in. Um, Public Works does a lot with the illicit discharge and detection elimination. Um, 
this is essentially, as, as Jen had alluded to, any time that something should not be in the storm water, should technically be in the sewer, like there's a washing machine that was most likely tied to a pipe that it shouldn't have been, and it, and it discharges into a ditch. Or we also see where um, car washes and things like that will go directly into a storm drain, and all of it, a lot of them are stenciled to say, but most of them go directly to a water body. It either goes to a ditch, which goes through a water body, or goes directly to, say, the marsh or wetlands that lead to the marsh. And then also, as you can see, a lot of times you might see some rainbows in the parking lot, meaning those pollutants, when the rain comes, will go directly into, again, those catch basins or ditches, which end up in the water bodies. So our goal is to um, eliminate any of those that we find. And this is where um, it's a collaborative effort, which is um, to say Public Works is out there being eyes on the road, but we also have uh, the police department, we have the fire department, um, community services has their own maintenance that they do around town with at the fields and as well as the school department. So everybody is kind of working in, in um, unison on that and trying to, as they arise, making the call in to either myself or um, Stephen Buckley at Public Works to um, identify when they see something. The other thing is uh, a lot of times uh, PD and fire are very good about their cleanups when they see car crashes, things like that. Um, it's pretty impressive that when you see it all come together, when you think they're not, I'm like, they're not listening to me, and then you see them out there cleaning it all up because <laughs> they get it, and I, I think it's really great to see. <coughs> And I'm going to skip from back um, from three to six. The last one um, is uh, good housekeeping and pollution prevention. So essentially, this is at our larger facilities, which these are two pictures of public works, um, our salt shed and our new fuel island. Not so new anymore, I guess. Um, but it's about basically cleaning up after yourself. And there's spills, um, there's protocol, if there's any gas that leaks around the fuel islands, things like that, keeping the salt and the chemicals in, contained and not getting out into the environment and washing off the site. Um, and same as within the building itself, anything you know gets directed to the sewer rather than into the storm drain. So it's about really doing the right thing and, and cleaning up after yourself. So and that includes also in that training for the crew, um, not only for Public Works, but all the departments that I mentioned are included in that. So as I said, it's all about the team approach and all the departments kind of working together. In so the, the two I'm going to touch on now, um, just hoping that I want you guys to feel free to kind of stop me and ask questions as we go through this. but. Um, our requirement number four is called construction site runoff control. And this is basically saying that the, the town, as the MS4, needs to have some oversight for the public and private properties to make sure that they're not, in, as they're under construction, that they're not impacting the water resources. And so this is a picture actually of the downs under construction. Um, we have a lot of construction going on in town. And this picture alone encompasses um, what, two, sub, two subdivisions and three site plans, I believe. So this is a lot going on <laughs> right in this small little window. Um, and we have inspections on site. Um, typically, we try to do a once a week on most of our sites um, just to make sure a lot can happen in a week on these sites. They go are moving very quickly. And so to make sure that everything's buttoned up, whether it's keeping um, silt fence or hay bales or anything, keeping the sediment on site, so meaning keeping all the dirt, the um, silt, anything stays on the site rather than finding its way to a water body. And so this is a list of our active sites right now. Currently, we are getting, as I said, most, most of these on a weekly basis, 18 site plan reviews and seven subdivisions. So there's a lot going on. Um, and it's, we actually have two third party inspection firms that help with that. Um, and it all comes through the planning and code office that we 
um, see those. Um, it starts with a pre-construction meeting. I think we've mentioned um, too on your a lot of your conditions of approval. We're finding that it's we start off on the good foot if we all meet and sit. Jamel's able to go through your conditions of approval, and make sure everything is checked off before they even break ground. We also talk through um, the fact that we are an MS4 community. I hand them a sheet of paper that says, here's the guidelines, here's what you need to do. You need to keep your site clean. You need to keep it all on site. Um, there's things like um, the frequency of the inspections. So everything's spelled out for development developers so they know what to expect. And um, like I said, we coordinate through our third party inspectors, but what I always say is um, two things keep your dirt on your site and everything's good. And the second thing is you don't really want to see me on the site because that means we've probably two or three times of inspections in a row, there's been issues. Um, and uh, most are really good about seeing the issue on a report and fixing it. And so basically what DEP has told us is they want to see that loop closed. So if there is a breach in um, the erosion control berm, they want to see a follow-up inspection report that says that that was fixed. And if they don't, if we don't have that closed loop, it is actually the liability of the town. It goes back to the town that we are not in compliance with our permit. So that's where I have to try to keep the contractors um, on what they're doing so that we don't get um, nixed by DEP. Wait, are you finding, is this, is this kind of your problem? It's a, it's a constant it keeps me busy. <laughs> <Really>? <laughs> and it's not, it's not on purpose, Roger. It's just there's so much going on. And I think contractors are moving so fast, and they have deadlines. And, um, and, and I will say, even on our sites, like if, if they're working on one side of the site and there's a blowout on the other side, if you're not having an inspector walk all the way around all the time, they don't know it until it's, it's a problem. Right, so we try to catch it before it becomes a blowout and you have set sediment in the wetlands kind of thing. So that's where it comes back to. Yeah, do you have standalone um, education opportunities for the developers, kind of like what you're doing here, and in, in advance of their submission to us? Because sometimes I get the feeling that they think we're being extraordinarily picky or cranky about <laughs> requiring something, but it's, it's clear that there are requirements that they were meeting. And I wonder yeah. if uh, an annual gathering of the contractors just to say, look guys, before you submit a plan, these are the things that we're gonna take a look at. These are the things that we're required. This is why we're required. This is what happens. Mm -hmm. And then um, come the follow up, you know, it's, it's much more individual, but I was just thinking, a meeting like this mm -hmm. once a year just to remind people so that when we get there and we say but we, we need we need X Y and Z more I will say I think over time certain um, developers that continually come back that have a lot going on and um, they're not the one-timers um, I can see over the years that kind of mentality changing, like they're they're learning as they go, and you can see that there's improvement. Um, but I think it's hard to get developers to put that time saying we're going to come in. But I think Portland does it, don't you? Well, a lot. Yeah, actually, we have. Um, I think they just had one. Did they just have one at the Jetport? Yeah, I thought they heard of that. Yeah. And I found out about it late like a couple of days before and I was like, oh my gosh, there's so much other information I would love to convey to yeah, all right, these Yeah, right, right, right. You have them in one room. <laughs> um, but but my, my guess is that, well, so a lot of the contractors working, a lot of the big contractors that are working here are working in Portland and if they're not hearing it here, which they are, they're definitely hearing it in Portland because we have a lot more people out <laughs> um, looking at, at all of that stuff. Um, and I mean, it is, it is probably a good idea both for contractors and mm -hmm. developers. My guess is that you you would get um, if you held an event like that, you'd get the you'd get the good eggs. You know, Sorry. you wouldn't get the one timers. <laughs> <laughs> You're gonna get the contractors that would, by and large, do it anyway. Um, and some contractors are certified with DEP and know what they're doing yeah. uh, more than other. Like you said, that's probably who you're gonna get at those. Um, but you know, for an hour or two, it's mm -hmm. it's probably worth it. 
and um, yeah. it would be relevant for, for far more than just Scarborough, I would imagine. Mm -hmm. So um, maybe next year, I don't know who put that on uh, from the city. It was at the Jetport, run by somebody that works at the Jetport, which I thought was kind of strange. But um, it seems like a good thing for that working group. I didn't. I don't think I realized that there was that sort of um, collaboration from the, that many communities. In that. Yeah. Um, yeah, because a lot of yeah contractors work obviously across municipalities. So, um, and and we hear that too. It's kind of nice, as I said, when we meet with our group, with the Izzyer group, is to hear the stories saying. So I'm hearing we don't have to do that in Portland, or we don't have to do that in Gorham. So we all kind of share our stories because we all are saying the same thing. And so it's kind of at least good to have that validation that, well, no, we're all saying the same thing. So that that's a good thing. Um, so who's re um, is it the contractor who's actually responsible, or is it the developer or the consultant? Or I think if DEP goes out to the site, um, they will. Um, well, first, they will expect the, the contractor who's doing it to fix what they're doing because they should know better and they should be doing the right thing, first off. Um, and, and none of them <laughs> want to get hit with that. Like, it doesn't look good for right. them either to get DEP fines. So. Right. Uh, this is a great slide. You know, it kind of captures the scale of yeah. the development activity in town. So I think this would be great to share with others. I had a question yeah. about the distinction between site plans and subdivisions. Is it a matter of scale or are they separate processes for approval? Jay might want to. Yeah, so a site plan is basically commercial activity or multifamily activity. Subdivision are is your typical single family lot creation. Um, so, you know, Dunstan Crossing and Eastern Village are a little bit of a mix of both, right? Um, yeah. But really, when, when we talk about subdivisions, about lot creation and dwelling creation, site plans are really about commercial buildings. Uh, the infrastructure, another good way to think about it is with site plans, the infrastructure is generally going to be private infrastructure. I see. With subdivisions, the roadways that are being built are ultimately going to come to council for adoption. So Mike and Angela are carefully coordinating to be saying, OK, is this road being built to our standard and our specs and our expectations for something that we're going to have ultimately the long-term maintenance and responsibility for so that, that's really helpful critical distinctions. thanks Jake one other follow-up question I have is who is the responsible official for the MS4 I believe Mike's name is on it now is it? <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell him. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> All questions for <laughs> <laughs> If you want the real answers, go to her. <laughs> There's always the official and then the real. Yes. <laughs> um, this is just a serious slide. These are actually pictures I'm taking around town. Um, I found as I went through some of my pictures today that I don't really take pictures of what it's supposed to look like. I take a lot of pictures of issues, I find. So um, here's one, just to give you, I guess, kind of walk through what I'm looking at is if you have uh, bare soil and a rainstorm comes, and I know it's hard to see in this, but basically there's a, there's a culvert in the upper left, and the water that sheets off that bare soil takes it down, and so below it is a pond that was constructed that is completely chocolate milk. And so the contractor tried to uh, dewater the area to try to fix what was going on. So you can see here, actually, the pump is off on the middle picture because I turned it off because um, they were actually pumping and it was coming through and on the other side. And you can see like a silt train heading off the site. And what happens is on the left, this is one of our urban impaired streams. Um, I got a call saying it is chocolate milk all the way down to the marsh. And that was from one development site. Um, so it makes a big impact. And you can see as it, co it can come in um, and mix with the clean water and head down to the marsh, which affects um, what we're finding with our Phillips Brook watershed management plan. One of the major issues for the health of that stream is, in fact, the development and the sediment that's coming off the development and um, and choking out some of the habitat along that stream. And so it also can affect clam flats and other things as uh, it's just not that na there's a natural level of sediment that moves through a stream and then there's an unnatural amount. So 
Angela, is this, is this one of the upper showing cloudy sediment coming in on the left? Yeah. Mixing with the clean water? Yeah. I want to make sure you didn't appreciate yeah, that. Sorry. The shoreline that's actually yeah, muddy sorry. water. <laughs> yeah, thank you. So I've got a question. So yeah. this is really coming up, you know, on the radar screen you know, in a big way. Is it a function of the scale of development that we're having right now, or is it just that people are becoming more aware, or is it, uh, you know, the effect of, <coughs> of uh, you know, more aggressive implementation of, uh, you know, of the, the regulations? I mean, I... Or is that so, a rhetorical question? I don't know. Is there an, an we've, had a, we've had an MS4 permit in place since 2003. Um, and so, like I said, every five years it gets – so more probably I would say the first permit was more of getting staff to understand that this is an issue. And then – so there's been all these baby steps up through. So now getting to 2019, <coughs> um, we're kind of at a level now where, I mean, we're going to start talking about our next permit, talking about sampling stormwater kind of we're heading really towards more of what's happening on the wastewater side I mean if you think about it in 1970 when the Clean Water Act that's when they started putting in sewers and pump stations and actually regulating what gets discharges so it wasn't everything the sewer just dumping into the streams um, and so there's been a huge progression in that realm and now they're seeing that Stormwater is also can be a pollutant the same same way in that a lot of these streams are getting um, into these unhealthy realms, and we'll look at later on um, we have we actually have three urban impaired streams in town, and they're all really associated with a lot of the high development areas. And one of the things that DEP has done is um, come up with some levels um, looking around the percentage of impervious area in these watersheds and once you reach 10 percent impervious area you start to see a decline in the health of the streams and you see it affecting the fish and not only the fish but the invertebrate and the the bugs everything um, which is a chain reaction That's i'll say don also part of your question is the town is definitely we're doing much more than when i started <coughs> working in town 12 years ago when you know it was probably I can't remember how long ago, five, six, seven years ago, that we even started doing these pre-construction meetings. Yep. You know, so it used to be that developers would get their approval from the planning board and get a building permit, and off they went, and, you know, they're just going to do what they're supposed to do, right? <laughs> so I'd say, uh, yeah. you know, a lot of the issue, I think we're seeing a lot more now because we're out seeing a lot more now. So we're seeing the good that's also happening, but we're catching more of what's going wrong, and we're getting ahead of it, and I think, as Angela said, People are becoming more aware that in this region and in our community in particular, hey, you know, if you're going to do work, you better do good work because you will get, you know, we'll, we'll, you know we're, we're now looking. So, uh, you know, I think it's a, it's a little bit of everything going on there. But I think, again, you know, a lot of it is we're just looking for things that we didn't used to look for. I've been struck by the number of issues there are with, with runoff and stormwater just watching, you know, the planning board activities. I had no idea. I mean, virtually, it's virtually every project has got some issues with, with that one way or another, so. Um, this is another one, not to pick on the downs, but actually this is a good thing. I wanted to point out a lot of the comments we come up with at Planning Board when we talk about protecting wetlands um, is, say, we talk about double erosion sediment control. You can clearly see in this picture on the bottom right the clear double row of protection and so we kind of this is what we look for is making sure they're following their their permit also in the middle where the trees are that was the wetland cluster that they had intended to preserve so it's making sure that what you guys are talking about when we go through it is actually happening in the field and that they're really limited to the the impacts that they said they were going to do on their sites is, so. is, is the double um, dependent upon the size of the development Typically, what we've asked, recommended for staff that planning board has supported has been when it's right up to or next to the wetland, so you have that double row of protection, whereas sometimes we just say you put it at the toe of the slope, you just do one row, and it has like maybe some sort of um, a vegetated buffer or a tree stand it has to get through before it hits the stream or a wetland, um, which is pretty, is, is suffice, but when you're right up against the wetland, you kind of need that double row, because if it gets past it, you're actually impacting the wetlands at that point. So that's where we've been at with that. Um, 
I'm going to move on to if, if I yeah, like, kind of well, those on the board who haven't been out there. Yeah. These are the single family um, yes. workforce housing houses that are going in, hmm. uh, 30 of them around there, and the whole center is intended to be a park. Um, both preserving the wetlands and trails through there and places for kids mm -hmm. to explore. <clears throat> so the next one and final requirement I haven't talked about is uh, stormwater management after construction. And a lot of times we talk about that with planning board is our chapter 419, which is the post-construction ordinance. Um, and so they've added those on the plans. There's certain notes that says that um, a couple things fall under this category though. Um, we talk about implementing um, or encouraging developers to use techniques for a low impact development. That's something we talk about when they come in and first talk to Jamel and Jay and I um, thinking of a project when we first start talking to design engineers or developers is trying to look at how the land is laid out and sort of forcing water in a different direction than it wants to go or things like that and looking at it more um, trying to treat the water, infiltrate the water on site rather than pushing it off to another property. So that's in our permit, written our permit that we will talk to developers and, and try to encourage the use. The pictures I have here, actually the one on the left is one of our projects. Um, our public works project on Cummings at Payne Road. That's the island at that big, big intersection by Lazy Boy. And actually Red Brook, one of our urban impaired streams, is directly runs diagonally through that intersection or under it. Um, and so we've actually installed a uh, filter, uh, filter system. There's a, you can't really tell, there's a little concrete box with a tree sticking out of it. So what happens is the water comes down the curb line and actually goes into that and goes through a special um, soil media that filters out some of the pollutants and then ends up back into the storm drain. So we, and then it flushes back out into Red Brook. So we're treating the water that's coming off the road before it hits Red Brook. And that was something that was done um, collaboration with South Portland because that project went all the way up um, to past Target. And they did the same thing on their ends. Their end is actually in uh, Long Creek watershed, so they um, are sensitive to um, wanting to treat the stormwater from the roadways in that watershed as well. So we kind of worked collaboratively and came up with um, options for treatment along that corridor. And so it was helpful to do it as part of another project. So as we were doing that and had the road ripped up, we could, we could implement some of these things. Similarly, we're doing on Gorham Road something similar to the one at the bottom. Um, this is from Falmouth, um, Route 1. It's this focal point system. It's basically a break and curb line. Um, and the water flows um, into these systems of, which are planted and, again, the water is filtered through before it exits into the wetland out here. That's what you'll find this uh, concrete boxes too. You'll see along Gorham Road. We also have a number of those uh, the re-roading of uh, Payne Road around the old Dunson School that little area around the parking lot. You'll notice there's some breaks in the curb. Mm -hmm. I think it has those that vegetation. I think it has uh, Rosa Rosa or something. Yeah, like that. but uh, it's a good example of another application. And the downs road um, and a lot of their development will have the same type of facilities. Out on uh, 114, yeah. I've noticed on the, as you're going out on the left, there's these dome, blue dome, mm -hmm. what are those? Um, those will be part of a swale. They'll actually come up around it, it'll be a swale system, so the water comes off the roadway, yeah. um, goes into the swales, and will um, infiltrate into through that same type of thing, a media, to try to get out the pollutants from, from the storm water. But it also has to be able to, if in a large rain event, it needs to come out fat if it fills up, so because it can't filter through fast enough, it needs to be able to go up over and into those rims and okay. into something. Um, it's basically an emergency for high, high storm events, big storm events, so that it doesn't flood out the road. Um, and I know right now they look like they're high, but it will look normal when it's done. <laughs> I promise. I, I promise, Tom. <laughs> he asked the same question. On the, right, on the right side is these concrete. Yes. What, what, and that's what those are, the tree in the box. Oh, is that what, so there's going to be a tree yeah. in the middle of that concrete? Yes. Okay. 
And the tree isn't the important part. I guess you should point that out. So the trees can come and go. Is it go. a fake tree? It is not a fake tree. <laughs> and it may not survive, <laughs> but it's doing its job even still. And that's what Tom had mentioned. When DOT put those in down at Dunstan, the, the vegetation failed. And so we're trying to find something that would thrive in, in a sort of a salt tolerant kind of plants you know what I mean so that as um, it's it's a pretty rough environment I would say so just getting something that will survive in there is a little difficult um, but we can do it and I think the important part to remember though it's not so much the tree it's the media that that's filtering through it's going through the soil that filters out the storm water just one quick aside my first <coughs> crusade that I want to make progress on while, while I'm here to do something along the Route 1 corridor. Uh, you know, similar, we've got these, these islands that are tough to manage and maintain, might be like that. Uh, but you also have this uh, paved surface that's two lanes in both directions. I don't know how wide that paved surface is, but it has to be, anyway, it's large. Yeah. There's no reason we can't do some low impact design, provide a little aesthetic while we're doing it, but also improve the stormwater quality along that in certain sections too. I mean, it's helpful to know there are multiple uh, parts to the design. I think the average person driving through Dustin or seeing places where these things are planted think it's mainly for beautification or whatever, but there are, you know, I have no idea there are uh, storm water uh, mitigation elements here at all. Right. Not, and, and that helps us to get credit. Like we. I report on all of this in our annual <coughs> reporting to DEP to let them know what, what steps we are taking and moving kind of this forward and, and moving that needle. And so that's, that's huge that we're not only telling developers you need to do this, but we're actually following that, that guidance as well and, and trying to capture the impervious area that we're creating. Um, so again, with. Um, the development that comes through, they have to annually report to us on any of the stormwater systems that they implement. So this is a wet pond, um, but any of the underdrain soil filters the planning board sees or any of those, um, I get on June 1st is a deadline. I have a stack on my desk right now. Um, we have, I believe, 11 that are required to, to report. I typically have to follow up with maybe four that I don't get um, and then there's a few that I need to push a little further um, and DEP has now been commenting on them in the annual reports to say what are you doing about those ones that aren't in compliance and so they're looking for the town to actually push or even find some of these developer developments that aren't doing their annual reporting so basically what they need to report to me is that not only are they maintaining what they have, but they're showing that it's still operating as it's intended. So all of these features that they're they're telling the planning board, this is how I'm going to treat my stormwater. If they're not maintaining it, and two five years later, whatever it is, um, they haven't maintained it, then it's not operating. It's not treating the stormwater they intended it to. You know, just to um, go back to something Don said, you know that um, that island up there by Fairfield Hotel. Hotel. Yep. Yeah. That's a good example where I think the average citizen would take a look at that yeah. and they would say, this is pretty elaborate. Is this really necessary? Why not just pave over that, have a raised island, pave over it and leave it like that? And that's where the public just doesn't understand. And it, you know, I think it's important to be able to communicate the important thing that you're doing you know, mm -hmm. to the public. Whether they want to read it or not, it's a different story. <laughs> but I mean, that, yeah, uh, yeah, no, I agree. They they see things like that and they think that, that's a waste of money. Mm -hmm. so. Um, so I know my time is, is short, so I'm going to try to speed this along. But um, basically, with our new permit coming up, there's going to be some new requirements. That's how this works, and so. Um, there is a greater public process, so it's more steps that the town has to take as far as town staff to when we come up with our plans and making sure the public is aware of those plans and that they have comment periods and that um, there is some feedback associated with that. There's increased awareness and outreach 
Um, we actually have some behavior change campaigns that we work on as, like I said, the 14 communities together. That is very labor intensive in trying to put um, numbers to that change to say, we did this campaign and how did it affect and, and their change in behavior. And that's hard to quantify. And so there's a lot of surveys and um, just other information and um, a lot of time consuming tasks, I think, um, that we work on as a, as a larger group, which is good. But adding more and more of those <coughs> in permit means a lot of more time and effort for staff, um, as well as they're looking at uh, doing more monitoring and sampling. So Scarborough is famous for um, obviously our marsh, which means our groundwater is very high. So essentially when they, it hasn't rained for a long time, they expect you not to have any water coming out of any of the storm drain pipes, which is not the case in most pipes in Scarborough. We always have groundwater flowing. Um, and so we're talking about part of this per, next permit is really taking the samples to make sure that that's actually groundwater or clean water coming out of that. Um, which is difficult when you talk about the environment that's around it too, where between birds and wildlife in that bacteria count gets high. And so trying to distinguish what that is too becomes a whole nother mess that we kind of get into. That's mess. Um, we're going to have a lot more plans that we need to get into more detail. So it's going to be, like I said, more staff effort, more maybe consultant effort to try to help us get to that, um, as well as ramping up the criteria within our urban impaired stream watersheds. And then just general oversight, the, the new permit is going to be looking for the municipalities taking on more of the compliance for these developers rather than um, relying on DEP to help us with that kind of informants, they're kind of pushing that down on the municipality and requiring our ordinance to change. I'd be patting Jay, I think it's the code office that's going to get Because um, it's more about enforcing um, the ordinance itself and, and making sure, so now DEP is putting that back on the municipality. Um, and so I alluded to before was our um, impervious um, cover in some of our urban impaired streams. I mentioned here Red Brook and Phillips Brook. The third one is Long Creek, which we have a very small piece of, but it's um, a very big deal that's happening around the mall area. Um, but it includes not only South Portland, but obviously a piece of Scarborough, a piece of West Brook, um, and Portland that we um, meet and talk. Um, I am I sit on the board for Long Creek Watershed District, and so we talk about ways to clean that up. Um, we have a watershed management plan for Red Brook, and we've actually got grant to do that. We also had a follow-up grant to do implementation work in Red Brook, which we've done. Um, Phillips Brook, we completed the watershed management plan based from a grant from DEP, and now we have been awarded an implementation grant for that. We'll be working um, Near Payne Road um, and Route 1, there's a laydown yard that Public Works use, utilizes. We're going to be looking at doing some work around there as part of that implementation grant. So um, we've been fortunate to receive many of those grants over the past few years from DEP, which has been great. Um, and also having the support for the, some of the match from our, um, in our budget from Council. Um, so. I just wanted to point out too, with the new budget um, coming next year, we'll be looking at some line items. There'll be some things that will come out with this new permit that we're going to have to look at as far as new equipment for public works and the um, the catch basin cleaning, the street sweeping. All of those things are all tied to this permit requirements. It's not something that we, as Roger said, that that maybe the um, public sees as, oh, we just want to clean up our roads, so we sweep up the sand from the, after the winter months. It's actually a permit requirement because that sand can end up in the marsh. It can end up in our streams. Um, so we're required to do that. So again, maybe we should need to, to promote that a little more, but so that's where it comes back to. Recycling the sand. <laughs> <laughs> like, what, 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 is what, what is the effort for us to keep doing this new thing? It's, it's multiple times a year. Yeah, well, I'm, so we have two sweepers, uh, and they've been running since since snow melt, and they continue to run, and we'll be running 
we'll have those two, both operational for another three or four weeks, and then beyond that, we'll be doing um, sweeping on major haul routes, for instance. We'll be sweeping in the Red Brook area additionally because it's an impaired area, so we want to do more housekeeping up there. Um, so it's it's just it's something that we're doing. We do it year round. Oftentimes, I'm asked, "Why are you sweeping in the middle of the uh, in the middle of the winter?" Uh, because uh, it's a lot. It, first off, uh, the, the dust that's created is dust when you sweep, but that dust that keeps you kicking up time after time is is a pollutant. Uh, it's the fines getting into the water that are causing the big problems, not the granular stuff. Uh, and also, it's 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 actually easier and quicker to pick it up off the street than it is to pick it up out of a catch basin. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's a year-round operation for us. So yeah. For, and for members of council, I mean, these machines are three hundred thousand dollars a piece. Yep. And we're talking about staff, probably two people at least three months, you know, a quarter of a year, they're behind the wheel of that. So it, it's a massive. <coughs> and I also think the other piece to keep in mind is as we move to sort of newer techniques, I think some of these rain gardens that, uh, maybe I'm not using the right term, but the tree boxes, the rain guards, those require a whole different set of, of equipment and staff. And, you know, it's, it's not just, you know, driving a truck, it's now driving a pickup truck, stopping with the right median that you have to dig out the top foot or two and put the right stuff back in there. Um, so it really is a whole separate thing than what the town is doing currently, but it's the direction we're being nudged and maybe even strongly pushed <laughs> by uh, folks at the state and the federal level. So again, another impact to our bottom line. So given the cost and rise in municipal services that are required for compliance with this Clean Water Act permit, <clears throat> how is the town planning long term to keep this in the general fund, or do they plan to follow suit with other towns like Portland, who actually have a designated enterprise fund like Stormwater and Utility District to pay for all these extra trucks, extra man hours, extra equipment, extra inspections, extra water quality protections? Where is the town on sort of this long range plan? Because as you said, the permits are only getting more and more stringent. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, I, stopped, uh, I purposely stopped short of advancing that, but I, I hear your point. I, I don't think the requirements will be any less going forward. If anything, they'll be greater. So we're going to need to find appropriate and creative ways to, to fund those needs. Uh, as you might expect, those are hugely unpopular. Most uh, <laughs> in Portland. Can, can it be put into tax in, increment, to, in the TIF sort of structures or mechanisms? Possibly. I envision yeah. fully loaded impact fee is sort of the theme that comes to mind. You know, For development? Of, yeah. I mean, impact know. fees. I think the way they work typically done is they pay an annual, an annual right. fee based on the uh, service, service that they're responsible for. Mm -hmm. So it effectively is a, another mm -hmm. tax. Yeah. And, if I, and if I could just say the impact fee is only a one time fee, yeah. and it's every year that the impact is, right. is, yeah. is felt. So. Yeah, and, I, and, I, and they're it's, a, it's a start, Don. Yeah. It's absolutely a start, but I think it's it's felt every single year, and Mike yeah. and Jay's territory keeps increasing. <coughs> yeah. I, know, I know the developers feel very strongly about it, but you're right, it's kind of a one-shot deal. Sorry, and right, look at traffic impact fees, for example. Oh. Yeah. You know, same right. issue, no. really. Yeah. The issue, you know, problems don't right. go away and multiply, no. but the fees are one. I, I think there's a few, few communities that have instituted those fees. They were really driven by the huge uh, tens of millions of dollars in CSO. Um, this is a combined stormwater yep. sewer system that literally there are tens and twenties of millions of dollars to, to separate the pipes. Right. Uh, so there's a whole different political climate yep. and cost associated. So I think we would need to be careful and deliberate how we roll this out. Yeah. And there is yeah, I think that's the one way we're fortunate in Scarborough that we didn't build the sewer system we until did. the yes. what was it seventies or what have you that we never combined them. Because the, is... those towns already have a CSO impact fee, mm -hmm. like they're already paying. They understand, well, not that maybe they don't understand, but they already have that implemented in there. So there's it's just another step. It's breaking that out separate, whereas we don't have that start from. It's really an education from the very beginning. So I appreciate you all sitting through that and. Great questions and
appreciate the work you do. Yeah, yeah, great, yeah, a lot. great presentation. Is, is there a way you can post this? Can you post it to your yeah. planning board? I don't know where you normally put stuff like this, but uh, I'd love to be able to share your links or direct okay. people to Great. Thanks. No? Okay. Very helpful. Thank you. Can we